Um, let's see. Resilience. Uh, the Institute on the Environment is, is pleased to, to, to uh, partner with IAS because of, as we have thought about cross-departmental, uh, as I have thought about cross-departmental institutes at the, at the University uh, of Minnesota, the IAS is the, is the closest to having the mission, the, uh, 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 a mission uh, analogous to uh, the Institute on the Environment. In particular, we're charged with addressing, each of us is charged with addressing complex problems that span a wide range of disciplines, often, uh, certainly departments, often colleges as well. And while the Institute for Advanced Studies has their roots in the humanities, and the Institute on the Environment has our roots in the natural sciences, we'll say. Um, certainly, the kinds of challenges that we're each trying to address, in particular, those related to the relationship between humans and the planet, be that uh, engineering, be that uh, uh, spiritual responses or art, um, are complex and multifaceted. And so it's always a, a, a pleasure to work with IAS on these, on these topics. In the Institute on the Environment, um, we're trying to create a world where people and planet prosper together. That world will be in the, in the future. We're, in some cases, we're doing better on that than we were 20 or 30 years ago. In other cases, maybe not so well. But the future is a thing that, that one of the things about the future that has changed in recent history is that it's no longer something that happens to humans. It's something that humans create. So we've moved past a time when uh, the human numbers, human technological prowess, human understanding were such that um, we were more or less subject to the whims of, of the natural systems of the planet. We now do things that change how those natural systems work. And we then have a responsibility or, and an opportunity to create a better future for humans on Earth. Um, I think about the aggregate quality of life on Earth. Off, usually I, I, I uh, say the aggregate quality of human life on Earth, and we can argue about that little nuance. Um, but today we're going to talk about, um, we have three distinguished uh, panelists who will talk about uh, the ability of, of human systems and, and natural systems to uh, function under stress and under change. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing their comments. And with that, I will throw it to Jennifer, who has some announcements and other things. Oh, I think there it is. Oh. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jennifer Gunn. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and we are thrilled to be here on the St. Paul campus. The INE, as Lewis said, is our peer and our partner, and we're always happy uh, to be working together. And actually, uh, we would like to be on the beautiful St. Paul campus and with the INE, even if it weren't for the fact that the NFL exiled us from our normal space. <laughs> Um, I'm going to make a few announcements and then uh, introduce our panelists for today. I think Lewis kind of summed up what this, what this event really is about and what it means. And so I just want to make a couple of announcements. So for any graduate students here in the social sciences and humanities, we are part of the University of Minnesota has a program sponsored by the Social Science Research Council and funded by the Mellon Foundation um, on dissertation proposal development. And applications for that program for this year are due on Friday, February 9th at noon. Uh, there's a lot more information and the application form itself can be found on the IAS website. Okay, next Thursday, we will also be traveling. We will be in Heller Hall on the West Bank. We're planning on hitting every bank this month. Uh, and uh, and uh, we're partnering with the History Department and several others to uh, bring uh, Frederick Knight, the uh, 
chair of the history department at Morehouse College, who will be talking about the third moment of the sun, black elders and generational politics in early America. Uh, and so finally, let me turn to, to the fun part of today, which is introducing our panelists. And our format is going to be this. Each panelist will talk about seven minutes or so. They'll kind of talk among themselves about questions their presentations have, have raised for each other. And then we'll open it up to the audience. So it's, it's very audience friendly and interactive. Don't, uh, don't uh, feel like you have to hold back. If, somebody's uh, making a point after the presentations that you really want to um, get in on, so to speak. So um, our first speaker will be Kate Knuth, who's the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Minneapolis, where she works on citywide resilience building efforts as part of Minneapolis's partnership with 100 res uh, resilient cities. And this is a Rockefeller Foundation program. Uh, She's a very familiar face in this room because she previously ran the Boreas Environmental Leadership Program here at INE. And she's a citizen member of the Minnesota Environmental Quality Board and has served three terms in the Minnesota House of, of Representatives from 2007 to 2013. She's currently pursuing her PhD in conservation <coughs> sciences uh, in the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Sciences here at the University of Minnesota. Carissa Slaughterbeck um, assumed the role of Associate Dean of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs this past June, where she has been a faculty member since 2004. And as an Associate Professor in Urban and Regional Planning, her research and teaching is focused on stakeholder engagement and decision making related to environmental uh, land use and transportation planning. And she has a particular interest in how stakeholders perceive impacts and use information in making decisions, focusing on impact assessment, collaborative decision making, and sustainability planning approaches. She served as director of the Humphrey School's Master of Urban and Regional Planning program from 2010 to 2014. And I'm sure you'll all hear more about her other work with the resilient communities. And Rupali Padke, last but not least, is a professor of environmental studies at McAllister College. She has a PhD in environmental studies from UC Santa Cruz. And her research and teaching sit at the nexus of environmental studies, international development and science and technology studies. Her interests lie in the democratization of science and technology decision making and the hybridization of technical expertise and local knowledge. Her current research focuses on private and public development of water and energy resources. So I will turn this over to our panel. All right, thank you for the introduction. So I, we're going to go down the line of the panel, starting on this side. I'm Kate Knuth, as, as Jennifer said, the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Minneapolis, the first Chief Resilience Officer in Minneapolis. We now have two in Minnesota. St. Paul just last week announced um, former council member, council member for a couple more weeks, Russ Stark, um, is going to be stepping down and then um, assuming the role of Chief Res Resilience Officer in the City of St. Paul, which is really exciting. Um, we're getting together in the middle and the green line tomorrow to talk about our <laughs> respective roles, <laughs> which I'm looking forward to. Um, so in framing my re remarks, I, I'll get to the Chief Resilience Officer work kind of in the middle and, and to the end, but um, I, I realize I actually have thought about resilience um, for quite a while. Um, as, as was mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate here um, in conservation sciences, and, and I use resilience theory um, and uh, as, as kind of the basis of how I developed my, my research. And I studied deliberate transformation. So um, and, and, the group, and groups that I argue do that effectively and, and what is it about them that makes them effective. And, and what that came from is the realization that resilience is fundamentally about change. Um, and it's about how do we how do we adapt to the systems we're in or transform to handle what's happening if we can no longer adapt? Um, and there's a whole body of <laughs> lots of theoretical work, you know, basins of attraction and stability planes, you know, stuff that I don't think is going to be super useful for today, but we can go into if you're interested. Um, and it's, I think, quite 
exciting to be um, working kind of in that space um, in the early, morning, early, early hours of the morning when I write my dissertation, and also in the space of this kind of newer work, which is how do we practically apply this kind of nuanced thinking about change um, and, and the idea that change is happening more faster and in more complicated ways um, that are challenging us as people and the systems we have developed um, in ways that I think show that our systems are not um, at the point they need to be to be, be handling this kind of change that's either going to happen to us or that we need to do gracefully, sort of the interplay between the two. So I, I, I bring that up because I think resilience is a exciting space to be working in because it is kind of making this bridge from a lot of deep um, kind of theoretical and intellectual thinking moving into literally like people who now have the title chief resilience officer and sort of the grad students in the room I joke with my with Lewis who I used to used to be my boss when I worked here at, at INE. You know, I I have a job now with a title that literally didn't exist when I started my PhD. Um, so I didn't even know this was a possibility of something you could do and that's kind of I think indicative of this kind of space uh, and the work happening in the space that, um, I mean, granted, I'm a long-term PhD student, but, uh, you know, longer than <laughs> you may like, but, uh, <laughs> so that, with that caveat, it's, you know, in the course of a, a degree, someone didn't even know this was a possibility um, in, until it came up towards the, towards the end. Um, and in Minneapolis, I, I, and then also more broadly, as we think about the practice of of resilience, and particularly city resilience or urban resilience, um, I think people, people around the world have kind of been intuitively doing this work, um, and it's now starting to have a name. Um, and it's, it, when, when working especially with the way we do with 100 Resilient Cities, we take a very um, broad perspective on it. So the definition we use is how do we make sure that our city survives, adapts, and thrives in the face of the ongoing stresses of our time and the potential big shocks. Um, and so that survive, adapt, and thrive is important. It's not just reactionary, it's about making our city better. It's about working with the most vulnerable. And then the idea of both stresses, things like right now in Minneapolis, affordable housing, racial disparities, um, and then potential big shocks like an infrastructure failure or a big storm. Um, and you know, the idea that stresses make our ability to handle any big shock, uh, it reduces our capability of handling those big shocks. So like that, it's like joke, it's like, do everything and you get a title. That's what you get to do and, and your time. <laughs> um, and, and I think, and it's this open, ambiguous kind of idea. So part of the challenge of doing this work in the city is, is just trying to help people understand what it means. And, and, and starting with myself, quite frankly, I didn't come in with a real like practical, this is what we're going to do, but a, kind of an openness to and curiosity about how we're approaching this work. Um, and so I think that is one of the challenges of developing the practice of resilience work is that it is such big work um, and, and kind of needs to be because the challenges and the changes we're, we're working with and trying to create are so big and systemic and connected in, in so many ways. Um, so it's you know not always the easiest when you're talking with like elected policymakers who want to like what are we really doing? What does that look like? And it's like well we're doing some research and planning, um, but we'll get to that part of it. And so that transitions I think to the to the third part of of what have we actually been doing in Minneapolis um, as we've become part of the Hundred Resilient Cities Network. And I think just for your if you're for your uh, understanding the 100 Resilient Cities uh, Network, it, it was really a big play by the Rockefeller Foundation. So on their 100th anniversary, they saw this um, intersection of several trends. Uh, one is urbanization, so more people live in cities. Um, right now it's about half. Uh, by the middle of the century, they estimate about 70% of people in the world will live in cities. Um, globalization, so we are more connected uh, and more interconnected and, and faster connected, both with information and then with the stuff we use and need to live our lives, and then also climate change. Um, and so those three things came together around this idea of urban resilience. And so 
Rockefeller decided to put $100 million into 100 resilient cities globally. That does not mean we get a million dollars in Minneapolis. That'd be, but that's not how it works. <laughs> um, but they have built this platform of cities over three rounds of cities joining in. And as a city, we get um, funding for a chief resilience officer position. We get support to develop our strategy. We get membership in this network, this community of practice around urban resilience. And um, we get uh, access to a platform of kind of consultants to help us work on projects. Um, and the idea is that it is useful work in the city and gets to um, Im be embedded and institutionalized into the city. And so the, if you know anything about Minneapolis city government or just the city in generally, um, things can take, what, the, what we've been doing is a lot of research and engagement and, and kind of planning. Um, and in Minneapolis, there, we have a weak mayor system. It's different than St. Paul. <laughs> we have a, quite a strong council. Uh, and in that, uh, we also have a really civically involved uh, group of residents and um, lots of ways for them to be involved, lots of nonprofits for them to be involved with, lots of civic organizations, arts organizations. And, and so it actually, I think, is taking quite a while in Minneapolis just to kind of wrap our heads around all of this from a resilience perspective. And so that's really the work we've been doing um, from the resilience office is, is what we call a resilience scan of the city. And it's based on engagement, hearing from people in the community in one-on-one -on -one meetings and workshops and in survey, um, and also doing research, connecting with the amazing professional staff that the city of Minneapolis is blessed to have. I spend an hour with our director, director of sanitary and surface water sewers, and she's amazing. We're lucky in Minneapolis, like we're ahead of many, many places in terms of our sewer systems, which is great from a resilience perspective. Um, and so a lot of those kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations with city staff to bring, it, bring that perspective into the, into the strategy. And then really trying to understand the resilience actions that are already happening in Minneapolis. There are a lot of them. Um, and people don't use the word necessarily, but um, helping us understand them and then also helping people understand that the work they're doing is is already in many ways resilience work. And so we're kind of in the middle of that. Um, we're, not <laughs> we're not ready to kind of put it out publicly, but hopefully will be soon. And that we'll use that to frame kind of specific focus or what we call discovery areas where we'll go deeper in our strategy um, and work with smaller groups to kind of develop actual initiatives, practical on the ground things we can do. Um, and the areas we're looking that I'm hearing a lot about in this work Perhaps not surprising if you pay attention to what's going on publicly, but affordable housing, uh, economic inclusion, um, and uh, reducing disparities, particularly on, along lines of race, uh, police and community relations, climate change, climate resilience and adaptation, and then also, I, I kind of think of it as civic engagement, strong democracy, and kind of Minneapolis' ability to do big things. We do many great things, but do we do the big things um, that we really need to do from a resilience perspective. So there's some questions around there. And I'm excited to dive in a little bit more deeply, but that kind of frames the way I'm thinking about this conversation. Great. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Jennifer and Lewis, for the introduction. Um, I'm Carissa Slaughterback, and I've been here at the university for a while, but newly in an associate dean role at the Humphrey School. And, but I've been doing research related to resilience and a number of topics over the years, and also, as Lewis mentioned, involved, or sorry, as Jennifer mentioned, involved with Resilient Communities Project for a number of years. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some bigger picture um, perspectives on resilience and ways that they can connect with collaboration, which has been a big focus of my research and the ways that I think about the role of urban planners in the world, and I'm an urban planning faculty member. And then I'll wrap up by talking a little bit about work we've done with Resilient Communities Project here at the university and with the broader community. So I think for me, one of the key aspects of resilience as, as I see it and as I think about ways to advance resilience is through collaboration. So I'm a researcher, I study collaborations, I have brought together collaborations, I've facilitated collaborations, I have evaluated collaborations from a practical perspective and also from a research perspective. So really have seen both through practical work that I've done and through the knowledge that's accumulated around collaboration that it's a key way that we can actually get to greater resilience in communities, greater resilience related to landscapes, and I think especially greater resilience in terms of thinking about the complex nature of environmental and social systems as they come together. So 
As you think about environmental issues, especially as they connect with social issues, or socio-environmental issues might be a term you're familiar with, we know that they're really complex. They're complex to understand. I think we, and we as humans, there's good evidence that we can't even possibly come close to understanding them because they are so complex. There are so many things happening. There are so many interactions. They're changing all of the time in ways that we aren't even able to detect. They're complex to manage. There are different perspectives. There are different values. There are different institutions, different organizations. All of that is relevant to the complexity of managing um, complex socio-environmental systems. And we know that there are impacts that are distributed across time, far in the future. Some are seen immediately. Some are seen somewhere in between. And we also know that they're distributed across a wide range of scales. This is a complex, messy, messy space to be able to be working in, but it's also extremely fun and interesting. And one of the things that I've seen is the opportunity that collaboration brings as a way to get to some extent a handle on this complexity. And I think also represent that complexity in the ways that we make decisions in this complex space. Because collaboration in a way captures that complexity and tries to represent it in an organization, in a decision-making structure, and by bringing values and people and ideas and knowledge together in new ways that are creative and I think can lead us to some level of innovation in working in these really complex systems. There's an urban planning professor at Cleveland State named Sanda Kaufman, and she wrote a book chapter that I keep coming back to called Collaborative Planning and Resilience in Complex Systems. And what she does is looks at sort of scientific understandings of resilience. What are those key components of resilience that were talked about in the introduction? Kate hit on them as well. And how do they match up with what we know we get out of collaborative processes? Processes where people come together across different organizations, across different disciplines, across different values, communities all of those pieces that we know are reflected in good collaborative practice. How do those two things come together? And I think which the point she makes is that they really match up really, really well. So one of the things that we are looking for in resilient um, systems is diversity. So we know that forests that have a variety of types of tree species are going to be more resilient to disease, to climate change, to all of those sorts of things. We also want redundancy. We want feedback loops. We want systems that are interconnected in ways that don't create walls, that we, where we can detect change quickly and be responsive to it and have systems to be able to work within that. We want to match to scale. We know that resilience is about systems and systems understanding and systems interactions. And in many cases, we don't have systems that match to that complex scale. They're not at the appropriate geographic scale. They're not able to think into the future in terms of the impacts that might be seen further down the line, for example. We want anticipation. We want systems that can identify entities within systems, institutions that govern or manage systems that can detect those small changes and be responsive fairly quickly in order to respond to something. And I think resilience um, also requires us to overcome the tragedy of the commons. And you probably all have sort of heard that term of tragedy of the commons. I think what resilience asks us to do is understand the nature of the commons, the ways that we all come together, and the need to be able to interact with each other in a much more productive way, understand the needs that each of us has and ways that we can work together in order to um, manage that commons, work in that commons, live in that commons, and be supported by that commons too in a more effective way. So if you put those pieces, diversity, redundancy, matching to scale, anticipation, and overcoming tragedy of the commons, those characteristics of resilience and put them side by side with the characteristics of strong collaboration, effective ways that we're bringing together people, I think you see a really strong match and you see a strong argument for more collaborative approaches to decision making, more collaborative approaches to management, to governance, to ways that we come together as a means of, res of advancing that type of resilience. So think about how does collaboration get us to diversity. Well, one of the things we know about great collaborations is they bring together people from different perspectives. They bring together people from, with different types of knowledge, knowledge that comes from their experience, living on the land, interacting with, with natural resources, for example, in an environmental context. We might bring together people of different disciplines, people trained related to water and air and wildlife and social systems, bringing them all together and valuing the unique knowledge that they have and the ways that they can help understand the complexity that we're dealing with. Um, diversity of experience, diversity of race, ethnicity, and cultural context that drive 
deep innate understandings of how people see these systems and live in them and experience them. Collaboration also creates redundant systems. Um, collaboratives are nat naturally distributed. If you have that kind of representation across different organizations, across different disciplines, across different communities, you have a distributed system where you have entities that are connected to each other, but also distributed in a way that, that you can identify changes, that you can be responsive, that you can come together in smaller groups, and a collaborative that persists over time, even, if you ha even once you get past a sort of formal collaboration. You also have the ability to match to scale. So if you look at complex environmental and social systems that are basically everything that we're interacting with every day, we know that those systems don't align very well with the boundaries of the city of Minneapolis, for example, or the state of Minnesota, or the Minnehaha Creek Watershed District, or any of those jurisdictions. We know that jurisdictions are overlapping. and. Most importantly, they're not really aligning with the system that we're trying to work in and manage and make better decisions about and actually get to be more resilient. So when we look at collaborations, we can be intentional about having representation related to different organizations, related to different types of expertise. We can better match to the scale of the issues, the problems, and the complexity that we're working in. I think we also, with collaboration, get to anticipation. And that sort of goes to that redundancy piece that I was talking about with a distributed group of experts, with a distributed group who are familiar with what's happening on the ground in a variety of communities, in a variety of contexts, we have that ability to detect at a finer scale changes that are happening, to triangulate that information and then bring that back to a collaborative to be able to make a stronger decision. And then I think overcoming the tragedy of the commons, which is that other piece of resilience, Collaboration and interaction that happens when people come together, I think, has the ability to highlight common interests. When we are coming together and sharing, reflecting on why it is that we perceive the, the commons in this particular way, our community in this particular way, the unique understandings that our discipline brings to us, to be able to share that allows us to reflect, it allows us to change in many cases, it allows us to learn, and I think most importantly, respect the places where other people are coming from and value all of the knowledge, all of the experience that exists to be able to make better decisions and advance resilience. I think my own experience working in collaboration as a practitioner, as an early urban planner, early in my career, as a researcher um, related to agriculture and water quality, working on endangered species and recreation and urban planning issues in Las Vegas when it was growing like crazy early on in my career, um, and work that I've done more recently here at the university looking at university community collaboration. I think what I've seen when we have effective collaboration is that ability to get to more resilient systems. I have seen evidence, I have experienced this in my in myself as a collaborator. I've also experienced it as someone who's facilitating these kinds of, of collaborative groups. I see trust. I see it emerging. I see people talking in ways that suggest that there is greater trust in each other, greater trust in a process and the ability to work towards something that's bigger than themselves. I think I've seen very clearly growing confidence in a process and growing confidence in the effectiveness of collaboration and getting to an outcome that's bigger than, than any individual. I've seen robust relationships that come from even brief collaborations that persist and exist and continue to advance um, the, the positive impacts of collaboration. I think, again, you get to a chance to learn about yourself and think about, well, why, why, again, do I think in this way? Why is this person thinking in a different way? What about their own experience, where they're from, their religious orientation, their cultural context? How is it that they have arrived at their particular perspective? And how did I get to mine? And how might we sort of realize that there are common values? I think we have the ability to generate new, or new knowledge just by simply coming together. It's not just additive, but I think the ability to to have a new perspective that didn't exist before. And I think the ability to sort of realize that there's more in common than we might have experienced before. Related to Resilient Communities Project, which again, I'll just sort of wrap up on that piece. This is a university community collaboration. And we called it Resilient Communities Project, one, because we were sort of transitioning practically out of the sustainability sort of buzzword and wanted something a little bit different. But what we saw is the great, a, a need for greater um, resilience ways to enhance that in communities. 
I don't think we talked about this intentionally at the beginning, but I think it's also a way of creating greater resilience within universities. In order to create this program that connects the University of Minnesota with one Minnesota community each year on projects that relate to resilience and sustainability, we are connecting across the university. We're positioning a variety of classes, a variety of departments, a variety of disciplines to bring their knowledge together and matching it with the aspirations of communities around resilience and sustainability. We have the ability to help communities think about changes that they're experiencing related to infrastructure, related to demographics, related to climate change, related to their changing economy, related to education and public safety, and a variety of issues that are really, really important to them. They're thinking about what resilience means to them. We're able to connect the university in ways that it hasn't been connected before and really think about the more resilient system that we can achieve if communities and the university are working together. Um, so that's it. I can say more later. <laughs> Thank you. Is it working? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for the invitation to be here to, um, to our hosts. And um, so exciting to be on a panel of women who work on resiliency. We share interest in collaboration and, um, and how collaboration can benefit strong democracy. Um, I have been theorizing for a while that resiliency is women's work. Uh, I see it when I offer a course and I'll, I'll have all I have is women who show up in the classroom. So I'm actually really excited to see that there's a dozen men among us today, <laughs> which is, um, so you know, I think it's a, a really wonderful sign that maybe things are, are moving. Um, so that's, that's a, a separate subject um, about women, <laughs> about climate work and resiliency work being women's work. Uh, I know we will have a chance for, for some conversation and some questions, but I'm really curious on a Thursday afternoon when you could be on the zip line across the Mississippi <laughs> that you are here to talk about resiliency. Right? And so just out of that curiosity, um, how many of you are working on resiliency in your research? Just to show of hands. How many of you are students studying resiliency? Well, we're all students uh, forever. But uh, how many of you see yourselves as, as community practitioners? So, you know, we come here with lots of different intentions, I think, and different understandings of, of that term. And I think I probably fit in all of those categories when I think about um, my interest in this subject. Um, so I. I'm a political scientist. I think a lot about um, power dynamics in around communities, around public policy decisions. I think I share with um, my my panel panelists, fellow panelists, an interest in thinking about how we do resiliency better and, and the status quo of that. Uh, my work is on public engagement, public participation in the context of controversial decision making around climate and energy issues. And I wanted to just share with you some of my own definitions for what resiliency means, how I have come to understand it, and um, times where I've tried to put it into practice, but also some of the things that I've been trying to be cautious about, or red flags I see in the resiliency discourse that um, might be a good point, a jumping off point for our conversation. So I think the classic definition of resiliency is our ability to spring back, or to be restored, or to recover in the face of um, most often acute um, stresses and shocks, right? And we can use that term to think about individual resiliency and um, how we as, as individuals respond to shocks and stresses. I have three children. We often talk about resilient children. We talk about resilient kids who in the face of change can show up to school every day. We talk about resilient children whose um, homes are constantly shifting, can show up to do their work. It's a term we use all the time. We also think about resilient communities. The term has come up already um, as communities who are able to bounce back from shocks and stresses. We need only think back a couple of months to the onslaught of hurricanes. And we talked about which communities were able to jump back and, and bounce back and which ones weren't. And I want to actually return to that with the example of Puerto Rico towards the end of, of my notes today. Um, but we also think about sort of material systems and resiliency, the resiliency of the electricity grid, of the transportation system in moments of shocks and stress. And my interest is really thinking about the individual and the community, but the space in between, the connections um, therein, and then also how 
we think of the role of the public, um, cities, the state, in helping support those individual and community aspects of resiliency. So I, I want to acknowledge and, and really have us think about the fact that what makes a person resilient might be entirely different than what makes a community resilient. You know, my resiliency as an individual may rest on, on who I know and my resources and um, my background and my, the history of my, my lineage, my family, the things that may privilege me compared to someone else that may also be at work for a community, but there may be very different things that create community resiliency. But I also think that there's a strong connection between what makes an individual resilient and what makes a community resilient. And I'm interested in working in that space in between. And so to do so, I found it really helpful to think about um, the idea of social cohesion. What makes us cohere as communities and families? And how do we continue to build and sustain that cohesion? And often that's about the kinds of networks that we're a part of as individuals and as in communities. So just to give an example from some of my own research and work, um, I was part of a really wonderful collaboration, to borrow your term, over the last um, four, four years um, with the city of St. Paul, working in partnership with the Science Museum of Minnesota, um, my colleagues at McAllister College through some grant funding we had. And what we are really interested in is thinking about this question of resilience. Actually, our project was called Ready and Resilient, um, which turns out to also be the slogan for the Army, which I didn't know <laughs> when I proposed the project. Um, but that, that project was really thinking about what are the barriers to resiliency and what are the barriers for public engagement. And we really came to this concept of social cohesion and, and realizing that the communities that we know historically and very much in our contemporary moment that can can um, cope with stresses and shocks are the most socially cohere. And how do you build that? And how do you, how do you take inventory of that? And so we, in, um, through our grant resources, did a series of workshops in the city of St. Paul. And some of you participated either um, as members of our workshops or as presenters at our workshops. And what we were trying to do was help um, neighborhoods, districts, inventory their assets, their skill sets, but also know what questions that they had and what resources that they felt they needed to help build that those social networks and social cohesion. And it was, um, you know, we discovered some really interesting things about what makes one neighborhood within a city different than another. We also learned a lot about um, issues of trust and sort of these historical, these legacy issues that created mistrust that needed to be overcome. And <clears throat> So I was really excited this past year to work in the city of Minneapolis to, to take some of the research that we'd done in St. Paul and sort of take it across the river and, and work in some communities in Minneapolis. And one of the things that we had the ability to do in St. Paul, which hasn't happened yet in Minneapolis, was to use the findings from our research to launch a community resilience fund. And I was so happy to see Trudy. Trudy um, was a recipient of one of these small grants um, in Hamlin, in the Hamlin neighborhood and, and what we found is that very small amounts of seed funding um, invested in residents ideas can help build social cohesion it really takes um, sometimes very little in terms of financial support although it can take a lot of other kinds of supports in order to build that and uh, when i heard that russ stark was appointed as chief resiliency officer i shot off an email really quick that said, you know, where can I show up and how can we continue our social cohesion or what we called a community resiliency fund in St. Paul because um, I think it was possible to do so much great work through those resources. Um, so let me maybe shift, um, I have just a couple of minutes left, to thinking about the, some of my concerns with the world resiliency. And I think, Kate, you let us off with that, thinking about how resiliency has these, maybe these phases of thinking of moving from survival to adaptation to thriving. And we see this in scholarly work on resiliency. I certainly see it in practice, that there can be a really important backlash to resiliency work. And I think it's very similar to what happened when we talked about sustainability all the time. Right? And, and by definition, resiliency is about restoring to a steady state. And in a lot of the communities that are most vulnerable, particularly to climate issues and extreme weather, they don't want to return to the steady state. That's not what this is about. It's about mobility. It's about moving beyond that, that status quo that, um, that found themselves in stress. 
And I think we really have to think carefully about when we use that word resiliency that we're not talking about that, right? And that we're being careful to think about who's it good for. Right? And that I think is an important part of the partnership building is really thinking about and just resiliency as a framework benefit everyone. And when it doesn't benefit some people, how can we ask for their partnership? on these ki this kinds um, of work. And so as I've been thinking about the parallels between sustainability and resiliency, I was reminded about the sort of just sustainability movement that arose to really take back that term and make it do more in the world. And I wonder if we're at the same place with resiliency, that we need to add an adjective to it. And, and maybe it's just resiliency, or, or maybe it's something else. We talk a lot about equity and equitable resiliency to really think about the power dynamics at work. Um, and so that really brings me to thinking of or being reflexive about the, work, you, the use of resiliency in my own research and thinking. And for those of you who are students or researchers planning projects, I think it makes me think about what does it mean to have a resilient research framework and a resilient method? And how do we think about our own ability to, to stay resilient in this work alongside mobilizing that word? Right? And um, as a research method, if we are working in this space of resiliency and resilient planning, how does our research have to really move beyond um, data to thinking about how people's lives are transformed? How does that become part of our research project? And it's, uh, I think, requires a lot of reflection on how we can do that and do it well. I think I'll stop there. Yeah? Now we talk to each other, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> or we talk with all of you. <laughs> um, I mean, I, one of the questions that I had, and I, I really like that framing of looking at collaboration and resilience together, um, and the idea of social cohesion, because I think kind of my hunch in this work is that um, if we're going to be really resilient, we need to be capable of making the kinds of collective decisions and progress at the pace and scale that are up to the task of the challenges and changes we're facing. And that's so hard. It's so hard. <laughs> like it's, mm -hmm. And I, 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 I kind of have to ground myself. And I spoke to a student group a couple days ago. And I just was like, we're, doing, we're, we're talking about really hard stuff. And I think it's important to kind of recognize that at the beginning. And, and so I'm curious, in terms of the collaboration, like, how do people, it's not easy as well, like how do people do it and keep doing it and showing up and showing up through the hard stuff or where maybe it's not working or maybe there's an annoying person in the other group that you're trying to work with and um, like really what makes people able to continue to do it? Because I think that sort of culture of collaboration and that ability to actually collaborate is part of what makes a resilient community. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think early on, as you bring a group together, and often, I mean, the collaborations I've been a part of are, are usually new, and it's for a reason to solve a problem or to, um, you know, work on a project or something like that. It might be stimulated by a grant or some, so there's often some reason to come together initially. But that's never enough to keep people coming together. And I think to be able to early on reveal where there's some sort of common value or common interest. And so to really think about ways that you can get people talking, get people sharing. When I was in one of my first jobs as an urban planner out of, out of graduate school, again, I was working in the Las Vegas region. The desert tortoise is an endangered species there, and there are like a, dozens of other endangered species, or nearly endangered species that we were working on as well. There was a collaboration that I was extremely lucky, from my perspective, to be a part of when I was doing that work. We had 40 or 50 people who came together monthly to work on this implementation plan around endangered species in southern Nevada. You can imagine the range of political interests, the range of jurisdictions that are represented. There's a strong presence of federal government there. There are advocacy groups on, both, on all sides, not just both. There are many, many sides around de protecting the tortoise. There are recreation advocacy groups. There are environmental advocacy groups that are irrelevant. There's a water group, there are multiple cities, and there's counties and federal agencies, and they're all sitting in this room. And they're all there for a reason, and that's because they have a connection to the land. 
and some way that they interact with this land, they might manage it, they might use it for recreation of all different types, including off-highway vehicles and things like that. They have a connection to what the land produces. The land produces water. The land has a connection to their history and their family that settled in this place and connects to the community that's so important to them. And even though they had extremely divergent views across the entire spectrum, you had a connection to the land and the physical space that was part of this community and is you know, so unique and so amazing and so impacted in all kinds of ways here. And to be able to reveal that and make that connection and create space to talk about all of those ways that land is valued and used and productive for lots of reasons was, I think, really, really important to keep people coming back, whether it's a horticulturalist working for the Bureau of Land Management to an off-highway vehicle advocate who you know, rolled in in his like, jacked up car with tons of stickers saying all kinds of offensive things about government and liberals <laughs> and turtles and all kinds of things. They keep coming back. And they're there because of their connection to the land. And they're there, they, you know, they're arguing around a table, but they're chatting at lunch. And they're interacting in the same room, and they might disagree with each other fundamentally, but they have a reason to be there to connect or to protect their interests related to the land, whatever that is. And if nothing else happens, they understand themselves in the bigger context. So. Mm. To me, that was just really, really powerful to be able to see that happen. Now I totally forgot the question that led to that. I was like reminiscing back to the old days, but um, but it was it's amazing to like have this like happen. In and front I of think you. I mean what I'm hearing from you say is this importance of identifying this shared interest. And mm -hmm. for in this group, it was the land. And I I mean I'll be honest. One of the things that I'm nervous about as I uh, kind of lead this work in Minneapolis, and I definitely don't I don't do it like it's a I see myself as a convener and a connector and a facilitator and a resource broker as kind of that's that's a narrative creator or not reflector more than creator um, and I think one of the things challenging our democracy right now and our resilience and I think the strength the health of our democracy is one of the things I'm most worried about from a resilience perspective um, is that we increasingly find it difficult to see what those shared interests are mm -hmm. um, and what, sometimes that's because I have all sorts of reasons why I think that uh, you know, the disparities in wealth, generally also along uh, uh, race, racial lines, um, the histories of distrust of government, the intentional um, sowing of doubt and of basically trying to undermine all of our truth brokering institutions. Um, and so this shared interest as people in a place or in a state or in a region or even as a country that's really increasingly difficult and so i that's one of the challenges i see in yeah. resilience work so how do you, i mean how do you start even within the city organization so mm -hmm. rockefeller's invested in these city resilience offers officers and one you know one way to characterize that tactic is they're now embedding someone in a city, and off, you know, in some cases they're coming from outside, in some cases not. But how even within that organization, and St. Paul looks different than Minneapolis, and every city is different, but how even in that organization can you think about collaboration and ways to recognize what are the common values among these people who are distributed across disciplines and departments and tenure and politics and all of this, mm -hmm. to, to start there as a way to harness all of that power and all of those resources and all of the connections that they bring and the ways that that can reach out to the broader mm -hmm. community. Yeah, I think, I think Rapali yeah. has been doing that a bit in mm -hmm. St. Paul. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, you, not necessarily in, in city government mm -hmm. itself, yeah. but in the broader community. Yeah, this conversation brings up a question for me and I'm really curious to ask you both about it, is that so much of um, how we measure ourselves as particularly as urban communities, is based on a set of indicators that we've inherited about job creation, about crime, about other things. And I'm curious how we might measure resilience in a way that um, makes people want to keep working on it. And I wonder if you've thought about that and what those might be. And clearly, they could be the same indicators we already use, right? And you've pointed out that safety 
an increased safety can be a form of resilience. But I wonder if there are other indicators out there that we can be looking to. And, and for example, in collaboration um, or partnerships, how do we count those? Or how do we, how, how do we find the things to count that make meaning out of this? It seems to me that it's also, it goes back to the point you were making, Rupali, about, um, about uh, resilience being about restoration to some idea of a status quo. And those indicators mm -hmm. and measures are also having some reference index. So, uh, you know, yeah. past, the world we have lost, the past that was better in some way, mm -hmm. shape, or form. And, and it strikes me that um, part of the challenge in, in building social coherence and thinking about you know, what should be our measures is that cities are changing all the time. So it's not like there, that it would ever be possible to return to a status quo because the conditions <coughs> are, are, are never the same either. So mm -hmm. in thinking about those kinds of how are we going to assess ourselves and where we are and, and resilience. Well, and I think I'm pretty clear. I don't want to restore some sort of past. Or like, I, I think I'm much more interested in transformational change in, in key areas that help us be adaptive at the broadest scale. So you know, 100 years ago or 80 years ago in the city of Minneapolis, if you were a black person or a Jewish person or an Asian person, like you couldn't buy properties in many areas. And if you could, you couldn't get a loan from the federal government because the areas that they allowed you to buy were redlined. And I mean, there's great work with the Mapping Prejudice Project, which I'm sure you know about. Um, but we see the legacy of that, both in the segregation of our city, where our investments in terms of how highways tore up certain communities once they were segregated, and then also looking at like things like sewer infrastructure, or even our emergency sirens <laughs> I've heard talk about. Um, not being as high level in certain parts of the city. Um, and this is that we're working on all of these things or have completed many of these things. Um, and so I think understanding that legacy and looking forward to heal that is really important. In terms of indicators, I've kind of, I mean, I haven't totally thought about this, but it, like, how many people do you interact with in your neighborhood? on a monthly basis. You know, my neighborhood now has a Monday, or a Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, except for this year, month for the Super Bowl, like we meet at our local brewery. We didn't have a brewery a year or two ago, and now we have one, and now we meet there once a month. And like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a resilience practice for my mm -hmm. little Bryn Mawr Area 7 neighborhood. Um, and, uh, you know, we could ask people about that in our residence survey, perhaps, like how many times do you interact? Um, do you know where to go if there's some sort of emergency, what are the information sources you trust? This is one I think I'm really interested in trying to understand better is um, when we have emergencies, um, information moves like that, you know, and it comes in our phones and Twitter or, God forbid, a, a, a message, an error about, or not, it's yeah. better that it's an error about a nuclear attack. Yeah, it's better an error, but it's like those 30 minutes were terrifying for millions of people. Um, and that the, so what, what are the communications lines that are trusted in different parts of our community? Because there isn't one. There is, a, there is not one source of information that's trusted, and that's a challenge, um, something we need to be thinking about. But in terms of measures, I think asking about people's connections, understanding where they get information, yeah. um, those are two that I'm interested in. And also that we have plans for keeping our infrastructure up. <laughs> it's like a, a very basic one. Mm -hmm. like, do our pipes and our streets and our electrical systems, are we keeping them up? One thing I'm thinking about, and this might be a question, bigger question for the audience and the other panelists as well, is when it's so big and it's so complex, how do you feel, how do you find your place in that and yeah. feel like you're mm -hmm. doing something? I mean, even as I sit here and sort of describe the things I'm doing, like, that's you know, I'm like totally missing a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> like how, <laughs> it's not good enough. I mean, when it's, when it's so big and there are so many things and it's so interconnected and so, you know, historically connected and so complex and not even understandable, 
how do you practice in this space and like and feel satisfied, mm -hmm. feel good about yourself, know that you're having an impact? I don't always know. Mm -hmm. um, some, I mean, sometimes I get a sense that on a small thing, there's a, there's an impact there. So I would love to know how you guys reconcile that, or any of you, <laughs> or how you're thinking about it, maybe as students who are thinking about working in this area. I can give a very quick response, and I'm curious what others say too. Um, and maybe I'm, maybe not everyone shares this sentiment, but this past year after the 2016 federal and state elections, I think has forced me to really look at where I want to put my energy personally. Mm -hmm. right, there have been so many marches that I could be going to um, every day, and so I think this really brings up this sort of self-resiliency as well. Um, so how, how do you decide the, the issue that's most important to you? And what do you do when that issue maybe doesn't align with what you spent your professional work doing on in that moment? And I'm struck by this this past year. I am an immigrant. The uh, politics of immigration have hit me really hard in this past year. And I found that um, even though vocationally I spent all my time thinking about climate and energy, that was not my biggest issue this past year. And it was driving me to new places and new, new actions and new communities um, that made me think about this and you know where how do we invest our time in ways um, that we find meaningful and impactful and how do we think about that in the short term in the urgency of the moment and over the arc of our perhaps our careers or our time as residents of a community I, so it's more a comment I than think a I have had that exact same experience in the past year so in addition to having um, this big change federally in the state level I have a small child, um, she's 16 months old now, and I, I took on a big new job and I'm trying to write a dissertation. It's like, okay, what do I really care about right now? And I don't, I don't do a lot of things that people ask of me that I used to just say yes to many things. Um, and I think that's important, and it's a very important from a resilience perspective personally, um, and about how your contribution in the world. But flipping that to the kind of the, the opposite scale, and this comes from my research on groups doing deliberate transformation, um, part of the challenge is it's saying, okay, I, I have to do what I want to do, do what I think is important and focus it, but the challenge you were talking about, Chris, I think is how is that enough? How is that enough for the things that we really need to do together? Um, and I think the power of these of groups that are working on transforming society is that it becomes enough because we're all working together on this thing. And together we can be enough. Or, or together we can have faith that will be enough. Um, and I think in our culture broadly in the United States, we have such an individualistic culture. In our, in our um, civic and political culture, I think over the last few decades has moved m even more towards individualistic and away from more of a communitarian focus. And um, Frankly, in academia, we have quite an individualistic culture. Um, that's how we're trained as students and getting the grades. And then as a, writing a dissertation, your own body, your know, own individual contribution to knowledge. And then, OK, we can work on some collaborations. And so there's a lot of, um, you have, to be able to hook into this bigger group that's together can be enough, I think, is something that I have recognized as quite powerful that I didn't really understand in the la until the last. Turns out studying something in a dissertation makes you hopefully <laughs> learn something new or realize something you didn't before. Um, and that's, I think, one of the biggest things I've um, been learning. Who's, who's doing questions? Who's picking? <laughs> we have a bunch of hands. <laughs> Mike, let me go ahead and ask a question. What's this on? Let me see. Okay, you can hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, Michael Russell in St. Anthony Park uh, was a soil scientist here at the USDA. But uh, what I find is that doing things on our own to reduce our energy footprint and live a more sustainable life is important. But what is energizing is to work in community through the community council. And that's something that students can do. You can join your neighborhood association or community council and put in a few hours a month to actually affect change there. And another way is through the transition town movement. McAllister 
is just starting one. There are several in Minneapolis and a few in St. Paul. And the transition town is a holistic way to uh, work with your neighbors on reducing your input and your, your uh, footprint, but also building a stronger community. In our council, we have an equity committee now. For the first time, two years ago, we started an equity committee in St. Anthony Park. And if you think about St. Anthony Park, usually you think about North St. Anthony Park. Lots of very expensive single family homes. 60% of our residents are uh, renters and 38% of our residents have household incomes less than $35,000 a year. Some of those are students, a lot of those aren't. Uh, so we now focus on that and to see the world through the frames of equity and climate changes, that's a really important change in how we see the world as we live it. If we just don't talk to the people we know, if we talk to people we don't know and sort of try to build trust, that can really help. So. I think doing something individually is important so that you're a model, and then doing something in community at whatever level you're, you're really comfortable with, you can actually affect change. I have a question. Is it? Um, so my name is Kelly. I'm a researcher here at the Natural Capital Project. Um, I have two questions that are closely connected, um, so I'll appreciate your answers. Um, first is, I'm new to the concept of resilience. And so my first question um, is, what's the difference between human well-being and resilience? Because I see, for instance, you mentioned Puerto Rico. I feel like a lot of that bouncing back really traces back to the level of human well-being that Puerto Rico had in the first place. So that's my first question, and probably why we need a resilient concept in the first place. And the second is for the, our guests. Um, from McAllister, I think, I'm sorry I was late, so I don't remember your name, is thinking, you mentioned that you're an immigrant. Um, so I wanted to ask you, is how do you reconcile thinking of resilience here in a Western country as opposed to resilience in the global South? And I think that also traces back to how we think of human well-being and resilience. So I'm thinking of these two questions very connected. Thank you in advance. <coughs> Should, do we take uh, some more or, or answer the next turn? We'll okay. More yeah, those are, are great questions. Thank you for them. Um, so I think of resilience as a category that is beyond um, human, human well-being in that it integrates our sense of, of ecosystem, of the non-human, the human in this very intricate web. So I think that's one differentiator and sees the interconnections, right? So human well-being rests on the resilience of our ecosystems sometimes, even um, more than maybe some of our social institutions. So thinking about it, um, my public health friends talk about the One Health model as being that which is trying to bring together the, the ecosystem, non-human and human elements together and thinking about resiliency. And so I think that's one differentiator. But I, but I think you hit on a really important point. Um, our, our communities and nations that have very high standards of living that could be measured across indicators, are they inherently resilient? Um, I think we can draw on lots of examples where they aren't. For, for lots of different reasons. And so I think this brings up this question about um, what, what, how do we measure resiliency? How do we see the vulnerabilities in our systems that maybe force us to look beyond the more conventional or orthodox ways of understanding well-being across, as many of you mentioned, you know, time and scale as well. Um, so the other question you had asked is about reconciling um, or, or maybe thinking about the local and global dimensions of the concept of resiliency. I th so I think this is a struggle because I think it's very self-defined. You know, a, a community defines its sense of resiliency and I think you would get very different definitions wherever you are placing that exercise around the world. So I'm not sure that I have one answer for that. Um, I certainly have had the chance in, in my lifetime to be in many communities that felt resilient that don't look anything like our community here. And so it's sort of thinking about what, what gives that meaning, um, in which conditions. Um, and and I, 
to your well-being, human well-being concept, and one that you might consider looking at in, in the literature is the idea of, of sustainable livelihoods, which I, th I think gets at I think wh what you're what you're kind of struggling with or that tension. You know, um, that literature, which is pretty expansive, talks about how sustaining one's livelihood is the ability to overcome shocks and stresses, acute and chronic, as well as thinking about the resource base upon which we build our livelihoods. I think one, one thing to look at. Um, may I make just a really quick comment? Um, so maybe there are others of you who are new to Minnesota. I have lived here now for 13 years. When I introduce myself, I still say I'm new here. And <laughs> it's the, but it's the longest place I've ever lived in my life. And that's actually one thing that I've been struggling with as I think about resilient communities. You know, what is it about um, some communities that I've lived in that have felt like home right away and others which are so hard to break into culturally and how does that reduce our, our sense of resiliency? Um, what is it about living in a place where now this is again the longest place I lived. I've raised three children in this community and yet there are still many days where I'm nervous about knocking on my neighbor's door if they don't know me because I know they're not going to open the door. Right? And so that those are challenges um, that I think we need to face as communities that, that here. And our, our neighborhoods are changing, the demographics of our cities are changing, but still when we think about what it means to be, um, to live in St. Paul or to live in Minnesota, I, I don't know that those definitions have changed enough to, to be flexible and incorporate all of the new people. And it really, like technically I'm not new, right? but I still feel <laughs> really new. Well, I, and I, I think this is interesting because I, this is something I, so I've done numerous one-on-one -on -one conversations around Minneapolis. Um, just trying to build relationships and get a lot of different perspectives. And one of the things I've, I've heard that I've actually really appreciated is that people, one of the things they most value about Minneapolis is um, immigrants and new Americans. Um, but I, I also think it's, we're challenged by, we, what, one of the things we need to get better at is welcoming and integrating new Americans. And I don't mean that as like change and become like the culture here, but change and reflect the culture here and also let's make our culture here reflect and be um, improve it like get mm -hmm. even better by having the diversity and the um, different perspectives that new um, new Minnesotans bring and I think I have because I don't think this is necessarily the conversation about immigrants um, Everywhere, it's not. There's so, there's a lot of fear in, in in immigrant communities as well, but I have really appreciated um, the positive and appreciation of um, immigrants here in, in at least in Minneapolis, and that's something I, I I do want to say because it's not necessarily that appreciation and that welcome and that interest in understanding and becoming community um, isn't always expressed. At the same time, I totally hear you. It's hard to connect. Um, and you know, I lived in Norway for a year, which is, I think, where some of this part of our culture comes from, Scandinavia. And I found it extremely hard to connect. And I was like, I'm tall, I'm white, I speak Norwegian. Like, why can't I connect? Like, I, I as much as any, I mean, I spoke not amazing Norwegian. But, um, and I think we have some of that cultural legacy here that we need to be aware of. <laughs> Thank you all for um, a really interesting panel um, and for the work that you do. Um, uh, Chrissy, you, you talked about the, the um, tragedy of the commons, and I think that's a real central issue here. And I, I, I think you kind of touched on ways that to approach um, bringing people together and educating them about what that is when, when you talked about your experience in, in, in Nevada. Um, but I was wondering whether, whether all of you could talk a little more about, about that. Like how do you, short of finding a way to put an economic value, and maybe that is what we have to do, on, on these things that are currently just considered um, common and not thought about. Um, uh, to, to, to get us to a more, uh, uh, more sustainable and resilient community. I'll, I'll just jump in and just kind of add one piece around educating them about, I think more about educating each other. 
And that happens by the sharing of perspectives, the bringing people together who understand land in different ways, who use it in different ways. And I think to truly get at that commons piece, you do need that sort of sharing and coming together rather than a sort of telling someone something. It's a telling to each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, though. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll let these guys jump in. Um, so, sure, I can jump in. Um, yeah, I was interested that you raised the tragedy of the commons, and, and I was sort of reflecting on that, too. So I'm glad this question came up. And that <clears throat> I'm really comfortable about talking about the commons, but I'm really uncomfortable about talking about the tragedy of the commons as a mm -hmm. term because of all that's linked and associated with that. Um, so for me, when I hear that term, my mind instantly goes to Garrett Hardin, the, the central um, author and thesis around the tragedy of the commons, and thinking of this idea of these, um, uh, you know, these individuals interested in their self, uh, self-interested individuals drawing upon a common that is limited, yeah. and how that gave rise to, you know, two decades of scholarship and political action that's linked to population planning programs and we can just keep unraveling this idea, right? I think we're all familiar with it. And so the tragedy of the commons to me is kind of um, a hornet's nest, right? But so what I'm interested in is how do we lift the commons out of that and, and maybe not think in terms of the, the tragedy piece and what about the commons can we use in a new way with new framings that we can all attach to, right? So what is what are the commons that are meaningful to us? Is it the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, that around which we have shared self-interest without thinking about the tragedy part, which, um, and I think for me it's the phrase itself. Right? And it's, it's one that it just, it's a visceral reaction. <laughs> so I mean. Well, and, and kind of gr building on that, I, I um, you know, we often, when we think about the commons, we think about air and water and land and I've, this help, that question I started thinking about, one of our challenges in Minneapolis is, is the city itself a commons um, as a place of culture and commerce and activity and coming together um, and of kind of diversity interacting. And, and frankly, right now, the commons of our city, if we can think of that way, is becoming inaccessible to more and more people. And um, who cannot afford to live there, who can not necessarily afford to travel and, and get around there, who can't, um, be, I mean, and especially in certain uh, racial groups, can't, can't afford to live there, getting displaced. Um, and how do we as a city make sure that we are a place where people from all backgrounds and be part of our commons of the city. I think there is a value that a city offers that's different than some other places that, um, that I think people should have access to um, and not only a subset of people should have access to. So that's not really a tragedy question. Mm -hmm. It's a, how do we interact with the commons? Who has power in decision making? Who can actually be part of it? Who feels like they are part of it? Uh, again, the tragedy of the common sounds like it's a, an individualistic frame trying to make it more of a collective frame where it's more about, I, I, like, I want to think of it more as how do we make the commons just work? At, at least when I think about the city itself in that way. And I, those are totally ideas I haven't articulated before, so a little risky to do that on a panel, but I guess that's what <laughs> universities are for. <laughs> Struggling, and back to struggling about the definition of resilience, because I, you know, I came here with the idea that when we were talking about resiliency and resilient communities, we're talking about ecosystems. But I've heard so many, so many affordable housing and um, resilient livelihoods, and so many different discussions of resilient children. But when you're all talking about resilience, what is the definition of resilience that you are talking about? I, so I, I, I do, I mean, 100 Resilient Cities has a definition that we're using, at least for now. We'll probably change it as we go through this process. You know, how do we make sure that people, institutions, groups survive, adapt, and thrive in the face of the big shocks and stresses 
uh, yes, changing climate and um, globalization and a federal government that's changing immigration policies so many people in our community are unsafe and feel unsafe and don't patronize businesses. So now they've lost <coughs> a good chunk of their business. That makes our city less resilient. I, I've struggled with this as I've tried to work in this space and I think it's important, help, it's, help, it's helpful for me to know, to, to understand that the ideas of resilience come out of several kind of intellectual traditions. So you have this kind of resilience of in ecosystems, mm -hmm. which is really important. And when we talk about social ecological systems, that's where a lot of that thinking comes out of. You have resilience and more engineering, which is more kind of like a hardening to make sure like something doesn't break. Um, and that's an, another tradition of it. I think in you know, psychology, the individual mm -hmm resilience of kids or um, there's other traditions you could probably identify as well but it's not one it's a very evocative word and it can be challenging to work with mm -hmm. because of that but I think also productive so are you as the director of resiliency <laughs> in the city of Minneapolis it seems like you have a really big job <laughs> <laughs> you're in charge of everything I mean I, I it's not in uh, the, the is that, is that uh, working with everything, but I don't think of it as in charge of mm -hmm. at all. <laughs> is that useful to expand that definition? So I think it's useful to start with quite an expansive definition mm -hmm. and then important and necessary to start. I think see this process as kind of a funneling of what, what really matters for our resilience now. Mm -hmm. um, so in a year, I can, I'll be talking about more specifics for sure. But... I do think it's useful to have that broad thing. Because part of the challenges we have come from the fact that we try to look at problems and solutions in silos and in disciplines and, you know, look at the committees we have, like, at the legislature on health and on the environment and on commerce and on, you know, these things that need to interact if we're really going to get at the root of some of the challenges we have. Um, that, I think, is one of the useful things of resilience is it it creates a way to work together in the broader systems. I think you, ra you raised a great point, though. I mean, part of its power is that it's very flexible. And <laughs> you have three people who I think mostly identify as social scientists. That's the realm that we work in. If you had three ecologists, we would likely be, it's not that it would be entirely different, but it might draw on different concepts and traditions and resiliency. And so I think the goal is, like, how do you bring people with these different frameworks together to construct a concept of resiliency that really is anchored in a place because I think it's hard to talk about resilience in the very abstract. Yeah. I think for me, thinking about resilience as working at intersections, intersections of ideas, intersections of places, intersections of disciplines, resilient communities are the intersection of community and university in these places where there isn't anyone who necessarily has a complete understanding nor a complete responsibility. And I think to be able to think about resilience, I mean, a lot of conceptions of resilience talk about ecosystems and sort of social systems coming together. And I think to be able to think about what's happening where those two come together and how you can understand that more deeply, what are the strategies to work within that space, and how can a resilience officer, for example, this new amazing role that now exists, how do they, are they positioned to, to be able to work at this intersection? I hadn't really thought about that until right now. But I, as I think of all the examples that we've talked about, I mean, they are, in many cases, intersections among people or organizations or ideas. Or are you looking at sort of risk, areas where there's great risk? Can you the I'm sorry, yeah, does it work? Is it, is it the intersections of risk in, this, in the city? or the society that that's where we, we, we're, you're focusing on? I, I think that's a really important part of it, is it. And risk is both about what are the threats and then what are the vulnerabilities to the threats. And so um, we need to understand both of those things. And, and also I think it's um, helpful for me to think about resilience from the perspective of are we preparing for certain specific kinds of things, like a specific resilience. We need to make sure that our sewer system and water management systems can handle increased rain events. Like we're going to have more rain at one time. Like that's just, it's coming. We can talk about the specifics, 
but we need to be preparing for that. So like that's a specific thing we need to work on. I think a lot of the things we've been talking about are more of a general resilience, <coughs> social cohesion, people having good information. I actually, one of the things I was like, wouldn't it be amazing if everybody in Minneapolis had $500 in the bank? Um, like that would be a fundamental transformation for our city in terms of resilience because people could handle something bad happening. And it's like 40% of people in the United States can't handle a $500 emergency without using credit. Um, and they may not have access to credit. Like that can throw a family into tailspin. Like that could be a fundamental shift. There's one of the most interesting things I've been, proposals I read, I've read about, it comes out of an academic as an idea of baby bonds as, um, and the, the idea is we have such wealth disparity in our country which makes us not less resilient and it's along lines of race especially based on all sorts of historical reasons mm -hmm. what if we give every baby born in this country a bond or a savings account or a bond that they get when they turn 18 and they can use to go to school start a business or buy a house and you can change it depending on um, what amount of wealth their parents have. Like that could fundamentally transform because we, we need sort of a leveling you know, in terms of, mm -hmm. in systems thinking, it's like more, the winner keeps getting more. Like that's one of the traps of systems and one I think we're in right now in our country. Um, so those are some of the ideas of like general resilience, but I think it's helpful to think of both specific threats and then also generally being able to handle threats overall. Or writ, yeah, vulnerabilities. So this is a question um, mostly for Kate uh, Knuth, but um, I was just curious to know, um, you mentioned, um, so this is a new uh, role with the city um, and you're doing some research. So I um, was just interested to hear what um, the kinds of things that um, you're, you're coming across at the moment um, yeah. in terms of important, um, important points of research and then um, also, um, what what does the um, your your meeting with the St. Paul Resilience Officer? Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, and I understand the Met Council is working on some resilience stuff. I know they have a, a vulnerability assessment coming out. But what are some things that are currently being done to um, integrate resilience efforts across the, the metro area? Um, well, that last question, I think one of the things to pay attention to right now is we're in the middle of comp plan time <laughs> in the Twin Cities. Uh, so cities have to do this 10-year comprehensive plan and they're being updated right now. And there's a lot of work trying to put the value of resilience into those plans. So that's a very specific place to look. Um, then the Met Council would be involved with that. Um, in terms of the research, I, I mean, I think... <laughs> Sounds maybe obvious, but like, Minneapolis, people in Minneapolis and Minnesota like do a lot of stuff. Like our government's active. We're taking like we're proactive. We have this 20-year street and park funding with an equity basis to it, and you know we have this plan. We've like looked at literally every mile of our 900 miles of sewers and are trying prioritizing based on which ones actually need it most now. Like really pretty impressive stuff. Um, and there's like so many civic groups that you can get involved in. Um, of all different kinds. And so trying to figure out here, I think one of the challenges is how do we capture that and, and fill in gaps, but more, even more importantly, get a kind of collective work to something bigger that really is up to the challenges we have. Because um, I'm not sure all of the good work we're doing is fully up to the challenges we really have. Um, so that's where I am excited about taking this work. I think just a quick comment about the Met Council, and I have so much respect for the staff of the Met Council, and I had um, a group of students that were looking at the resiliency planning at the Met Council, and one of the things I thought was really fascinating, this is a multi-year project that they have, that they're rolling out, you know, piece by piece, is the challenge of knowing when do we tell people about it? Right? What layers of it do we share with the public at what time, for, for what ends? And I think that's a really interesting challenge with all of this, right? At, at what point is it um, provisionally enough to go out and get ideas and feedback 
and then go back in and yeah. you create these iterative stages. And um, again, I have so much respect for this press at the Met Council, but I know that this was uh, kind of scary about deciding, okay, well, maybe we need to wait six more months and get another um, series of data and another set of maps, and then that's the right time. And so how, how do we build the trust in the system so that we as citizens can interact with things that are in process without those members of these agencies always feeling like they're going to meet demands that they can't meet and have to make promises that they can't keep, but instead to have it be that collaborative um, piece that you were talking about. I think this question about what is resiliency is really fascinating and kind of makes your brain hurt in some respects. But uh, Rupali, since you referenced ecology, and I'm an ecologist, I feel like I want to throw in my <laughs> two cents. But um, resiliency is a concept that's well understood in ecology because you see it and it's a desirable in terms of promoting ecosystem function and we see it expressed well where they're in diverse systems that are healthy. But I do think that what's spectacular about the concept of resiliency is that it is everything, right? In the sense that it invites you to think about systems. It's about the connectivity and it's a desirable quality. It always has been a desirable quality and it always will be. And you can see it in things like, you know, immigrants are resilient. They have to be resilient by definition, right? We want resiliency in our children, we want resiliency in a storm water system. So what is the similarity among those things? Uh, there are many aspects that are similar among those things. But I also think it's the moment in time that makes resiliency as a desirable quality important. And that is that we confront a moment in time in which resilience, whatever it, wherever it's manifest, is crucial from a climate, from a global globalization from an economic point of view, from a patterns of human migration and demography point of view. Uh, it is the, it's the stressors and the forces that act upon us that make this desirable quality, quality so crucial now. And I feel like a key role for us to play in resiliency work is to ask, where do we stand in these desirable quantities and where do we need to be? It's like, it's kind of like sustainability in that you don't know what it is, but you know when you're moving in the right direction, and you just want to make it more of that. And yeah, or when it's challenged, that's right, when it's under stress. So to mm -hmm. me, I'm sort of comfortable with this squishiness as long as it's a thing that we know that why we want it, how to make it, and why it is so important in this moment in time. That's my take, at least. Response. <laughs> I, I agree that this, it, it, there's a lot of change happening at big scales and fast. And resilience is all about giving us tools to think about and respond and navigate, live and not be completely stressed out and anxious and not feeling like in control of anything. Um, so I think you're totally right. It is a really, there's a reason we're talking about it now because it's, are the systems we interact with and we've created are forcing it, forcing us to because, yeah, it's, it's because of the times we live in, I agree. I think, I mean, to your point about moving toward it, I think that's what, I mean, that's what gives you the ability to keep working on it and feel that you're, you're making progress, is that you do have a sense that you're moving towards something and that that allows you to continue working in this space that feels like progress is slow and that you're not addressing all of the yeah. complexity, but you're moving towards something and you are able to see and experience and understand that you're moving toward it and there are positive impacts that are being seen. Mm -hmm. You, we all, not just individuals, but communities, in institutions, us as a university, as researchers, as people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm mindful of the time, so I'll be brief. Um, oh, uh, I think the reason why resilience is so popular now as a term is because we've seen how brittle our systems are. And every time that hurricane or that 10 inch rainstorm, or these things happen, we're faced with the brittleness of our systems. What, and and they're, they're human, they're, they're social and ecological, but it's, so it's in our face. And sustainability didn't do enough. And it, it didn't do enough to face the, the, that brittle um, quality of of our experience. So I want to thank our panelists, thank our hosts, the IME, and uh, and I hope we'll see you next week.
speak in Heller Hall at 3.30. It's now IAS Thursday, since we are not Thursdays at 4 anymore. <laughs> and 